thank you very, very much um, for telling me actually what Heritage Tours and Foundation is about because I know very little about it and also for the introduction and many thanks to Khaki Tours and Khaki Foundation for inviting me to give this talk and a very special thank you to Farooq Jijina for convincing me that I may have something to convey about a topic which this audience is rather well versed with. Um, I begin this talk and I think I need to begin this talk with a qualifier. I'm not a historian of Bombay or Bombay presidency. So I'm very prepared to stand corrected um, if I make mistakes about certain aspects of histories of 19th century Bombay. Also, the talk is not about issues of heritage management and expertise or aspects of what some of us call the authorized heritage discourse that roots heritage practice. It is actually an attempt to create a view of the importance of following histories of collections, collecting practices, museums, um, and heritage making so that we also begin to learn more about the histories of the cities and the geographies we live in. So um, these are the two caveats with which I begin, as I said, this talk. And I'll start sharing the screen um, after this amazing um, last year, last week's uh, talk by Dr. Sorabji. I'm not sure about my um, slides today because we really got an amazing view of the city. But uh, I also have a habit sometimes of not explaining slides. So I expect questions from you all at the end of the talk about them. Now, heritage today looms very largely in our lives and the overt visibility of heritage through advertisements, including heritage hotels, heritage food, which is something you talk tomorrow. And I show this cookbook for you to you all from Dishum, which is a restaurant um, which is opened in Bombay, but they have this, it's a Bombay cookbook. And it's got things like, you know, advertisements which were there in the early parts of the 20th century inside it. Um, so all this actually, all these kind of the, the ways in which we are bombarded with heritage sometimes makes us forget that heritage is after all an experiential phenomenon. Heritage creates a perception of something which is handed down, something to be cared for, something to be cherished. Yet, as scholars of heritage remind us, heritage is something we actually do. It is a cultural process of meaning making that engages with acts of remembrance. It creates ways to understand and engage with the present and the past at the same time. Heritage, therefore, is not a thing that can be found out there. And importantly, the selection of specific pasts in the present, which heritage represents, is, as we know, very value laden. And here I come to the politics of heritageizing. So the power of heritage is precisely because heritage is curated. Um, you can see actually here at the last slide, the entrance to the new offices of the Archaeological Survey of India. It's in Tilak Road in Delhi. And what you do see, I mean, it's literally strewn with the past. So you have the copying of Ajanta Binoy Behel's uh, photographs, which have been re-photographed by the Archaeological Survey of India. And it's cave number one which is uh, there, which is kind of splashed across the balconies of the archaeological surveys uh, of the entrance room. And you see the Garuda chariot from Hampi. On the other side is actually a Vishnu temple, which they have brought out from UP and they've placed in. So what I'm saying is that the sense of curating heritage actually now comes out very, very obviously from even officers um, of, of the custodians of heritage. Some of the seminal ways of making or ways of heritage making has involved archaeological conservation, circulation and consumption of antiquities, museums, museum making, and strategies that foster an understanding of culture, experience, and identity. And here we need to note that what people do at heritage sites, and this is, as you can see, um, Buddhist pilgrims in Rajgir, it adds to the processes of heritage making. The other one is showing a Muslim uh, man praying to the skeletons found in Mohenjo-daro. This is from 1926. Now, one of the unassailable historical phenomenon is that our notions of heritage change over time. And we can see that the understanding of what constitutes heritage and legacy 
shifts and it has shifted quite significantly over the last 150 years when heritage making actually in the Western world became a phenomenon. In studying heritage, we begin to regard the manner in which notions of patrimony, traditions and legacy are established and historicized. We also ask questions such as whose heritage, whose culture, and we see that many communities continue to have no voice regarding how their cultures are exhibited and what they consider their ancestral legacies are collected and curated. And I show you an example here from the Tribal Museum, the new Tribal Museum in Bhopal, which actually makes a case of going to the source communities and asking them to showcase their objects. Whereas the old displays, which you see in this Indira Gandhi Rashe Manav Sansthale Bhopal, there, despite the fact that they engage with the source communities, the source communities themselves are also sometimes curated and displayed in terms of people showing, making things, making objects, etc. And this understanding of tribal heritage is very, very different. And the ways in the practices of this heritage curation is actually very different from the practices, say, of the World Heritage Series and the World Heritage Legislations, Monuments of Monuments and of the Museum Collections. So here we mark many anthropological museums in the Western world. And I would say most of them are from the university museums. And I'm showing you one in which I have worked for the past 15 years, for a long time, for 15 years. And also, um, uh, so this is in Cambridge and the other one would be the Pit Rivers in Oxford. But they both have notable histories of colonial collecting. And they have taken a lead in reorganizing the displays of indigenous material by actually making a clear, transparent move towards ethical curatorial practices. They've sought the guidance of the source communities um, to direct their curation. And what you see here is one of the first exhibitions which were held off Torres Strait Islanders in 1998, which coincided with the first um, or the 100 years of the first fieldwork of anthropology, field an anthropology as it began, began from Cambridge, where the Torres Strait Islanders, the elders were actually brought into the museum and asked how they were going to showcase, how they were going to label, what text panels were going to be there. And since then, it has been one of the biggest projects of repatriation, not in terms of taking all the material back to the Torres Straits, but in terms of actually taking photographs back and getting the expertise in a relational database. So I will not go into that, but this is in a, in a way, uh, these museums have shown that the acts of reorganizing um, their collections, even in text panels, informing the visitors of the rectifying practices which they do today. So in our calls towards preserving and managing heritage, we often forget to engage with the complexities that surround the issues which are related to the rights of legacy. And these rights actually comprise intellectual property rights. We really negotiate the implications of something called the traditional cultural expressions, which is an acronym called TCEs. For example, we mindlessly accord values of collectivity and universality to the tribal art, universality, sorry, to tribal art, which allows us also to freely appropriate traditional knowledge of indigenous communities as being authorless. And when I say authorless, I don't mean in terms of that we don't accord them with author. We say that this is from this tribe, but we don't accord them with the kind of authorship which we do for art, where you have a single individual who's the, who's the author. So it basically this stuff becomes in the legal matters kind of ownerless. Heritage practices therefore present the need to place ethics at the heart of a discipline or an investigations methodology. So placements would allow a way to inculcate ethical practice beyond codes or formation of ethical committees. And at the risk of reiterating, we may say that sites, materials, blueprints, policies, governance, and institutions, in short, all the material culture of expertise has to situate ethics at the core rather than the exterior of heritage creations and heritage research. So in thinking through the topes of curating heritage, we also begin to see the importance of juxtaposing histories of 
heritageization or rather heritage making with histories of visualization. And I draw into these histories of visualization again through a long, long um, work uh, stint in curating photographic collections at this Museum of Archaeology and Anthropology. Because the, by placing the practices of heritage making and by play and histories of uh, vision or visualization together, we can demonstrate quite clearly the acts of creating visual realities in ways in which a physically absent past is made to be seen, is shown as here and now. And an example I have worked with has been with inferences in the city of Banaras, which is what I'll show you in a slide, through the archaeological scholarship of the 19th century. This study has shown, for example, the archaeologists tried to bring up the gods of Banaras as Buddhist, and that was their colonial policy of saying that if Buddhism could go away from India, the longest and the most ancient religion, so could the Hindus. But this um, this archaeological story um, of creating a history for the city, the most ancient history for the city of Buddhist Banaras, actually tells us very, very clearly about acts of creating visual realities. It's not that vision or seeing actually kind of exists out there. This study also shows that the understanding of cultural heritage within the academic study of archaeology remains quite akin to celebrations of visibility of the archaeological evidence. So histories of photographing the field or taking pictures during field research demonstrates that seeing actually has a very complicated social biography. Moreover, Photographic reenactments of ostensibly showing examples of the possible uses of historical terrains by past inhabitants often facilitates creations of a tactile and a materially recoverable ideological ethos. And this ethos actually is a civilizational tradition. Again, that doesn't exist. It is actually ideational. So placing visualization at the heart of evidence making shows us the utility value of recalling the colonial histories of seeing India. For these histories make us very aware of the hierarchies that embed acts of seeing. And we remember that the British saw, whereas the natives, they said, were always seeing things. The natives, they always had fanciful imagination. And I draw upon a history here of Colin Mackenzie, who was one of uh, India's first surveyor general, who surveyed a Shiva temple on the banks of the river Krishna. And when he was asked, uh, when he asked the uh, resident Brahmins um, near the temple, the meaning of the carving on the temple, he was told by them that these carvings show how our gods live above. To which Mackenzie said, they, i.e. the Brahmins, seem to have lost all traces of knowledge they may have formerly possessed and sunk into the profoundest state of ignorance. Now for Mackenzie, the value of the temple lay as a historical source. For the Brahmins, the temple constituted the present, alive with the presence of their gods. So we might wish to actually remind ourselves that this, these stories, these colonial histories of unequal encounters, which we often draw upon, they continue to visit histories of encounters in field research. They exist today, especially when an expert's eye is unquestionably presumed to be more informed than the eye of a non-expert, but local, somebody who has lived within a geography for a long, long time. Now, the Western views of India of the 18th and the 19th centuries also remind us that correct seeing does not always equate with the correct manner of reading evidence. And this happened even amongst the British and the European surveyors in the 19th century. And an example here is um, Richard Carnock, who was uh, the governor general um, at some point, he was the governor general of the Bombay presidency. He also went to Andamans. His dismissal of the astronomer royal John Goldingham's account of the rock cut caves at Elephanta. Goldingham said that these rock cut caves were Hindu. Karnak said instead, and I quote him, I have had from Mr. Goldingham 
a person of much ingenuity and who applies himself to the study of antiquities, some drawings taken from the cave of Elephanta. They are most accurate I have seen and accompanied by correct description and um, having been a Hindu and the gentleman argues favorably of its being a Hindu temple. Yet, he said, I cannot assent to this opinion. He presumed them to have been built by, and I quote, the Abyssinians who inhabit the country on the west side of Red Sea opposite Arabia. Now, this has got a longer history, which I will not draw into. But what I'm trying to say is that we see certain things, same things, but we come up with two very different inferences. And these have implications on the ways in which we think about what heritage to preserve, what heritage to draw upon. As histories of consumption and circulation of photographs would testify, visible realities of the material world are constantly recreated. And therefore, photographic archives become really important things to think with. Like all collections, they also remind us that cataloging and descriptions are not neutral practices. And um, I heard Rohan saying that you're interested in doing archiving. So these practices of archiving are very important to think through, analyze, and also to actually create, have certain protocols because we realize that both cataloging and description contribute to ways in which we create and display the facts we choose to fashion as history. Now I take the opportunity here to simply display some photographs from Bombay, which are in the Museum of Archaeology and Anthropology's collection and reiterate the point that photographs are complicated artifacts because a photographic image that appears to us as fixed, be it a glass plate negative or an albumin print or a lantern slide is interpreted very differently by different audiences. And you can see here the two, I show this picture of the Natch girls um, and of the lantern slide of a Hindu merchant who's actually called the Aryan type because both of them were placed in the natives of Northern India, the book natives of Northern India, which William Crook wrote in terms of the races of India. And as you can see, we um, these are obviously not Natch girls. They, they would have been just ordinary residents or whatever they were, but the story of who they are have been actually obliterated from the Torrens archives. Photographs, in fact, demand us to recognize the importance of engaging with multiple originals. And with this, I draw upon a story of Nineveh in Bombay. And this is just simply a photograph of the Khandalas, just to tell you, I mean, and I was actually, when I was going through this, I was remembering um, last Saturday's lecture by Dr. Sorabji when it was today and before. So you have some to just see, see in terms of before, and especially this um, album and print of Khandala, which was taken by Cecil Bendel, the first professor of Sanskrit in Cambridge University, and this would be from 1892. Now, the, and, and I said that photographs allow us to engage with this understanding, with the notions of duplicates, which archeological uh, scholarship often trivializes. So copies, duplicates, fakes become actually some of the collecting, um, some of the facts, some of the antiquities, which one would say, or objects, which one would say of heritage. And I go into the story of Nineveh. I also think that the story is very well known because I spoke about it in the Bhauda Jilad Museum in 2019, and I think they've put it up on the YouTube. I stand corrected here by, by um, a doctor in Bombay who told me that I'd got one aspect of the venue wrong. Um, we'll come to that. So the story informs us. This, this, these are the exhibitions of ancient Assyrian artifacts in Bombay between 1846 and 1848. And this story informs us of the ways in which antiquities and collections are used in placemaking schemes. In this case, a collection of foreign antiquities became the conveyor of local needs, and they were used for showing off the historical legacy of Bombay, which was then being ascendant as an international port city. And the first slide of this is the three museums which are implicated in the story, which is the Museum of the Asiatic Society. As you know, it's, it began as a town hall and then the Asiatic Society's headquarters, the Bhauda Jilad, which is in Baikala, and the Chhatrapati uh, CSMVS, which is uh, because the Prince of Wales Museum ultimately acquired these antiquities. 
Now, these antiquities were consistently used for demanding a building for the Central Museum of, and I quote here, the natural history, economy, geology, industry, and arts in Bombay. This was established in, 19, in 1847, and it operated from the town hall. Notably, George Birdwood, the curator of this buildingless economic museum, emphasized, and I quote here, a red and shrewd traveler recalling the story of Babylon, Nineveh, Tyre, Jerusalem would naturally anticipate the highest manifestation of intellect within the gates of such an active mart as Bombay. But such a visitor would search in vain for stately streets, theaters, markets, fountains, public offices, museums, and art galleries. Now, these economic museums were established in India by the British from 1840. The first one was in Calcutta, and then in many Mufasil towns, including in Agra, Sikandrabad. And they were built on the premise, and here I quote the Brits, who said, the more we know India, the more valuable it will become. And there is nothing that we can see more likely to conduce to this desirably acquaintance with this country and its resources than the general establishment of a museum. The funds towards a building of this economic museum for Bombay were sought throughout the 1850s by hosting unique public lectures on the exhibitions of these Assyrian antiquities in the town hall, of which there is one example of a one by Mr. Beddoes in January 1855 to the accompaniment of a harmonium. The musically composed, uh, the musically scored lecture, as you called it, was advertised as the highest intellectual treat of the highest order, and was poised very specifically to collect a sum of money which will aid in forwarding the usefulness of the infant career of this economic museum. Now, the histories of the presence of antiquities of ancient Assyria involves three exhibitions, um, and these in Bombay, as I said, between 1846 and 1848, of specimens of three shipments, which came from the cargoes of the Assyrian antiquities, which were excavated by a diplomat and a British antiquary called Austin Layard. He excavated at Nimrud, um, or it, rather it should be called as Kyunzak, which is called, which he thought was Nineveh in the late 1840s. And the other Assyrian artifacts which came to Bombay was in 1847. There were gifts of 10 slabs, which were given by Henry Rawlinson to the city in 1848, a city in which he made his first career. He became, he was a cadet of the East India Company and he rose to a very, very prominent position in Iran first. Then he became a diplomat in Mesopotamia. Then he came back, um, and he is um, the um, excavator of um, a site called Varka in Mesopotamia, and also one of the um, so-called fathers of the deci uh, decipherer of the Assyrian cuneiform. Rawlinson's gifts were for sure exhibited in the town hall throughout the 1850s and the 1860s, and they inspired the antiquaries and the educated residents of Bombay to keep abreast of the news of excavations which were happening in Mesopotamia. And I just show you the in terms of Nineveh of Bombay, this was Layard's book which came out. It was a bestseller of the entire 19th century. It was published in 1849. And this is the map which was made during a uh, uh, it was commissioned by the British Museum. It was made by Captain Felix Jones while the excavations were being held. And after seeing this map, the citizens of Bombay demanded, and they said, we desire no less for Nineveh, but would like to see the streets and alleys of the metropolis of Western India surveyed and laid down with something like the fullness and precision with which the capital of Assyria is represented. Now, the larger story of these excavations of Mesopotamia, which this exhibition history forms a part of, follows a successful French invasion of Egypt in 1799. This invasion, uh, which was Napoleon's invasion, in fact, it added value to the biblical geography of Mesopotamia, which is, uh, I just hope I have the map, which is, this is the biblical geography, uh, as a strategic place en route, India. And the archaeological explorations of the French and the British from 1800s bespoke of the competitive nature of this nationalistic politics. And here, uh, let's, I'm sorry, I'm flicking this, but I'm just hoping, yeah. So the first excavations happened 
uh, but undertaken by the French, by the Orientalist Paul Emile Botta in Khosabad, and Lea's excavations actually followed. But the first surveys of this area happened again, was hap um, not happened, sorry. The first surveys um, were undertaken by Claudius Rich, who was the first British resident of Baghdad. Um, he acquired the residency in 1811. These antiquities, the excavations actually fueled rivalry between France and Britain regarding the procurement of the sensational um, finds. And the finds, as you can see, are massive. Why is this? As you can see, these finds are, were considered to be sensational. This is the winged lion going into the British Museum. It's a sensational photograph, which was actually um, um, first published in the Illustrated London News. These, are, these were um, huge obelisks and relief panels with scenes of war and royalty, winged bulls, winged lions, mythical human figures. Um, in the British Museum and the Louvre, the antiquities were stored, displayed, and seen for over half a century as materials with historical potentials, but with no actual histories. And here, we um, actually recall that Layard had suggested that uh, all the inscriptions from these, um, uh, the surface of the marbles were to be removed so that the forms of the figure could be seen. So actually in a funny way, through his excavations, he also took away some of the context of which would have allowed them to understand what these, what they had excavated. Now the meanings which the objects accrued in Europe throughout the 19th century included their identity as remains of the palaces of the Assyrian kings. They were therefore endowed outside the context of their fine spots without a knowledge of the script which many carried upon their surfaces. And the European world also got quite fed up with these antiquities. And I quote here Richard Westmacott who, um, was the architect of the facade of the, the pediment in the British Museum, which you see, who said, if we have one tenth part of what we have of Nineveh art, it would be quite enough as specimens of the arts because the arts of Chaldees is very bad art. So the biblical association that attended all the meaning making ventures challenged interpretations of this imagery in Europe and all these antiquities came to be misfit objects of the British Museum. Um, therefore, the reception in India of these objects become important and here um, we are reminded of the citizens of Bombay's reception asking for uh, amenities, civic amenities. And we are also reminded of some of the Nineveh objects which got drawn, as you can see, the antiquities, which actually influenced the interiors, a part of the walls of the Albert Hall at Jaipur, which is today a museum, Albert Museum, uh, Hall Museum, as they call it, which opened to public in 1887. And possibly some of the architectural features of Bombay are, I mean, this is Parsi, uh, as you can see, it's the Vacha Agiri. Some of these may have been influenced by what they saw. Now, we only know of one exhibition of these um, antiquities in Bombay. And it is, um, uh, this is of the first of Layard's cargo. It was undertaken at the behest of the Asiatic Society of Bombay. And this is where I stood corrected in terms of the venue, because this too was held at the Grant Road buildings, which I think we saw in, um, in one of the photographs on perhaps more than one of the photographs of Dr. Sorabji last week. Um, and the buildings were described in 1851 at the eve of the opening of the great exhibitions in London as a swamp theater with surrounding marshes and burial grounds in which half a lack of public money was thrown away unwisely. And the report emphasized that although the building was called a place of public amusement, no one ever went there to be amused. Now in piecing the sketchy report of Layard's last shipment, this is the first shipment and the last shipment had probably this black obelisk of Nimrud, um, which arrived in Bombay in 1848 which Layard subsequently accused the Bombay government of pilfering or lax policing of its, uh, of its cargoes, the Asiatic Society demanded the plaster cast of some of the specimens. And the plea of, for plaster casting was, 
and they said, since the whole collection was public property intended for the information of the people of England and paid for it, in part at least from the purses of Her Majesty's subjects in India, it was considered expedient that the cost should be taken of it for preservation in Bombay. The members also noted that few of us are ever likely to go and see it in the British Museum. And after the work was completed, they declared that had the other specimens now complained by Laird as of being broken or destroyed been similarly treated, they might have been readily restored. So this is also perhaps the first example we have of plaster casting antiquities within the Indian shores. The black obelisk I pull out throughout, it seems to be, made into a plaster cast as the captain of a ship who later took these antiquities reported and it may have possibly served as an architectural element within the city of Bombay. And here I'm indebted to Mr. Vinay Talwar who asked the same question last time as well to Dr. Sorabji about an obelisk road. Mr. Talwar tells me, I mean, he's given me this information which is a native town of Bombay. And if you actually click on that link, you can see uh, the dunk, uh, the obelisk road. What I found out yesterday is from the Dishum cookbook, which shows you because this obelisk road is supposed to have run parallel to the Duncan Road and the Parel Road and which connects it with the Grant Road. So it was probably here, but this obelisk road actually is marked on the map, uh, which uh, uh, for uh, the website for which is there on this slide. And we could ask then, Whatever happened to the plaster cars, the other plaster cars, and one possible avenue of inquiry here opens up through a little known collection of plaster cars of reliefs and sculptures at the KR Kama Research Institute. These were donated by the Prince of Wales, um, as it was then called in uh, 1961 by Moti Chandra, in fact, the eminent art historian to the Institute, or oh, that's what they record, but there are seven large plaster cars of Assyrian marbles. And one hopes that research would illuminate upon the histories of their uses during the 19th century, because what one would like to know is how were these exhibited within Bombay, if they'd actually been made for the city. One of the reasons for making the plaster cars would have been that Bombay gypsum amounted. There was a large abundant facility of gypsum around Bombay. And these were actually historically made, they said, from a slave ship that of um, Abyssinians who, helped in making, the slave ship was called Mahi. It was docked in the Bombay port. And there were Abyssinian boys who actually helped in making these plaster casts. Now, if indeed some of the plaster casts of Nineveh marbles of Layard's cargo were exhibited in Bombay in the 1850s, say in the town hall or uh, at the coffers of the Asiatic Society, which was there, then we could see such an exhibition as Bombay showing off its acquisition of antiquities of the most spectacular archaeological discovery of the times. Such an exhibition, when poised against George Birdwood's statement, embellishes contemporary heritage creation of a splendid cosmopolitan international port. Histories of Nineveh in Bombay, therefore, reveal the importance of regarding the connected histories also here of people, things, and places in our constituents of heritage making. Now, plaster casts of Indian architectural feature, which came to London and other places in Europe, increasingly from the 1870s, were viewed as representations of the strange and wondrous constructions of the East. They inspired on the spot photography of buildings, and we note that some of the surviving ones of the Eastern Torana are being taken out of their closets. And you see one here, on, which is going to be placed in the Humboldt Forum, which is being newly built. And the advisor of the project, who unpicks the symbolism, unpicks a new symbolism for this um, plaster cast. And she says, it's a messenger of transformation that illuminates transcontinental migration of images, symbols, shapes, and ideas. Clearly, the Sanchi Torana is being molded to fit into the concerns of global histories today. However, this may also be a good way to rethink the agency about religious architecture in today's increasingly communalized worlds. Now, the propensity of material world, and here I mean quite specifically antiquities and monuments, to move in and out of histories and challenge social relations and experiences leave many examples in, um, in the reports. 
Because the photographs of the finds of the Ashokan pillar was used for the poster of this link, I take this example. The inscribed pillar was actually found on the 15th of March, 1905, during the excavations which were led by the PWD officer, Frederick Oscar Ertel. And this find strained relationships between Ertel and John Marshall, who was the Director General of the Archaeological Survey, because Ertel was disappointed that with Marshall for failing to mention him by his name in the yearly reports of the archaeological survey and for ignoring his interpretation that this pillar was the same object which had been seen by Huan Sang, the Chinese pilgrim who visited India in the 7th century AD. But more importantly, the nationalization of the elements of the Ashokan pillar at Sarnath allows us to see the manner in which religion was actually deracinated or rather erased from the antiquity which were earmarked for national uses at the cusp of Indian independence. There's a large wheel that symbolizes India's Chakradhwaja, which you can actually see at the back of the pillar and which you can see in the Sarnath Museum, which um, it was historicized by Ananda Kumaraswamy, an eminent art historian, probably one of the pioneering art historians of South Asia. And he said, what the wheel stands for in Indian symbolism is primarily the revolution of the year as father time, or he said, Prajapati Kala, the flowing tide of all begotten things dependent on the sun. In 1946, when asked to carry out the conservation of the wheel and the lion capital, whose wheel we are told now graces the Indian flag, V.S. Agrawal, who was actually the curator of the um, the museum select collection, uh, section of the archaeological survey, he enhanced the object's religious imminence and the immateriality, <clears throat> and he emphasized that there is no cult allegiance here in the symbolism of the Mahachakra and its accessories like the four lions. Here, one is face to face with an acclamation to the single, unmanifested, and undifferentiated divine phenomenon. Thus, the nationalization of the Sarnath wheel has entailed the careful cleaning from its motive of its many possible meanings through informed scholarship. This also happens many a time in um, histories of heritage making. We often speak about, in, in these histories, or we often speak about heritage as something which is universal, especially in relation to world heritage sites. Yet heritage has always, embo has always embodied the particular. What, um, some of its key topographies are nation, region, unique cultural forms, and therefore overlaps in schemes of national and regional heritage making has expectantly nurtured many conflicts and fierce contestation. And one example here is from 1949, when the government of India requested the Archaeological Survey of India to review the Ancient Monuments Preservation Act of 1904 in order to bring it into line with the new Constitu Constitution Act. A statewide relisting of monuments followed, and this relisting actually built upon the British classificatory schemes of sorting sites, ruins, and monuments into those which were worthy of central, of the protection of the central government or the protection of the state government or those which were left to hang as miscellaneous. And here, the central government instructed the archaeological survey to accommodate the rock cut caves of Elephanta and Kanhedi into the Union National List. And it's taking its claims, it strongly rejected Bombay Presidency's request for custodianship of the two sites by noting that, and I quote here, the Bombay government is carrying out extensive improvements in the National Park at Kanheri and dual control by the state and center over the Buddhist caves at Kanheri has given rise to some difficulties. The Bombay government aims to convert the Elephanta caves into a holiday resort. Now the above, peremptory strike for the custodianship conveys the cultural politics of Indian nationalism of the 1950s, when policies and laws regarding monuments, which were then considered the cultural heritage of India, were established in more than a usual legal speed. Such imperialisms of nationalism is quite clearly seen in the national exhibition of the Indus civilization, which is still there in the National Museum, provided it the, we do not know actually what has happened to the National Museum right now, but one just hopes that the building still exists and the exhibition is still there. What this exhibition does is it effectively erases the regional characteristics of the Indus civilization while blatantly highlighting the systematic Indian efforts of finding most of the Harappan world since the 1950s, ironically, through regional surveys. 
So the Harappa Gallery at the National Museum, it curates the India's Harappan heritage and neglects quite prominently all the regional aspects of this Bronze Age phenomenon. The display is largely through types. So we see cases full of terracotta figures, terracotta animals, seals, ornaments, vessels, gamesmen, implements, weights, etc. And these types fashion a history of the core feature of the Indus civilization and not of any of the disparate features. We also see certain kinds of labeling as the one which you see in front of the urn, which proclaims quite blatantly the, um, uh, the ways in which we can conjugate the civilization with the so-called Vedic, with Vedic India. And what these kind of displays remind us quite strongly is the ways in which curatorial practices often facilitate collusion between scholarship and exclusionary politics. Now, heritageization, we may say, beckons a multi-layered performance, be this the performance of visiting, managing, interpreting, or conserving. They're all usually, they all embody acts of remembrance and commemoration while negotiating and constructing a sense of space, place, belonging, and understanding of the past, be it, albeit in the present. Here, the politics of decolonization in South Asia tells us that remembrance also entails silencing. And we know this politics, which was imbued with the partition of 1947, which affected the division of British India's institutional assets. The steering body of the partition council managed the division of the archives and collections, extensive camp and office furniture, field and laboratory equipments of the central government offices and of the colonial gov governance. The division also followed the subsequent acts by India and Pakistan of nationing the archaeological spoils and the Harappan Gallery is probably one aspect of that. So the Harappan Gallery in the National Museum, it exhibits the foundational collection of India's share of the Indus civilization in 1947 and it comprises objects from Mohenjo-daro and Harappa which were all partitioned from their series. Of the lesser valued uh, divided goods is this pottery vase um, which was found during the excavations of Mount F in the Great Granary uh, Mound in Harappa. The, fine, the Great Granary is today, as you, you might know, it's just called as a Great Hall. It may have been a place for dyeing textiles. The find was recorded in the excavation report, and I quote here, as two rough carinated pottery vessels marked with a cross in the concave upper portion. India has only one of this vase, and we can expect a similar looking vase with the same field number, which is 2919, although with a different accession number in the collections of the National Museum of Karachi. However, it is in the displays of the jewelry of, from Indus uh, civilization and Taxala, which are in the first four cases of a new ornament gallery called Alankar, which in, ought to encourage curious visitors today to pause and look again for they are shown many halved pieces and objects which evoke a visual sensibility of being displayed without a pair. A closer look, for example, at the girdle, which is there, which is the orange thing which you can see on this and um, reveals that it has only one end spacer. And this object and the jadeite necklace, which is on the top, um, they were both partitioned into two pieces during 1948. They were refashioned in July, in July, and unlike the Carnelian girdle, the jadeite necklace was actually physically spliced as it was found with seven pendants suspended by means of a thick gold wire. You can see the original necklace in the excavation reports pictures. The division of this necklace has involved the removal of the gold wire and separation of all the beads. We note the instructions of sharing, which was quite precise, and India received an extra bead because Pakistan was allowed to retain a larger share of the gold jewelry from Taxila. Here you see a picture of the jadeite necklace as it is in Pakistan. It's got three pendants. And these, this, this, this collection here are actually those which are there in the Karachi Museum. Now, in fact, when we look at some of the letters of these the archives, the minutes of the Surveys Museum branch notes that out of 145 objects of gold and silver jewelry in the Taxila Museum, only 47 had been brought to India. And in terms of gold in Tolas, about twice as much of gold has been left behind in the Taxila Museum. The minutes and all other official correspondence reflect the matter of fact manner in which the division was actually undertaken. 
And the curatorial protocol has remained, has been to remain silent of the partitioning of these spoils. So despite the two refurbishments in the National Museum of this jewelry gallery, one following a scandalous theft of some of the jewels, the labels and publication catalogs have never informed visitors why they're shown half pieces. This silence is a conscious act of erasing the fraught histories of nationalism and also decolonization. Now the displays and circulation of antiquities and the past has always served political and ideological ends, even in the distant past. And if we choose to reflect upon objects and collections, we often realize that, what we, that we know little about them as well as what they may inform of the past. And I'm just literally showing you four examples of which we know very little. We really don't know what they are. Um, the striking statue of Kanishka, for example, exuding physical strength, prompts us to ask, what did the local people make of it? What notions, if at all, of foreigners colored their perceptions in their regard of their image of their king? Histories of objects often tell us that objects impose upon storytelling in ways in which those who guide how they are to be viewed cannot control. And heritage histories consistently illustrate the numerous ways in which ideational ideas are transformed into visible, tangible, and valid evidence. Despite proclamations of rights of all to their heritage, heritage making is a specialist enterprise. It privileges expert values, nurtures a professional practice that has been systematically institutionalized since the late 19th century, and now appears well codified in a bewildering range of official documents and processes of heritage management. Foundational, as we all know, are the charters of UNESCO um, and of the ICOMOS. Moreover, global processes of ethnic assertion and redefinition, changing ideas about the nature of democratic pluralism and intensifying struggle over anything defined as cultural property now converge upon our notions of heritage. So heritage embeds a number of contradictions. It is a lived reality that is seen only when constituted. It is an immaterial phenomenon whose presence is made material through curation and its conservation has often involved acts of disinheriting and destruction, which have also brought irreversible changes within the societies who claim this as their legacy and within nature. Yet, heritage appears as a livelihood option and histories, including of aspects of Bombay's cosmopolitanism in the early 19th century, show us the striking agency of popular discourses. Additionally, increasing research and writing on heritage tourism shows it to implicate a plethora of consequences other than characterizations as a leisure activity. And I show you these slides, the two slides from Mysore or Mysuru as you would say, it, because it was my first encounter of heritage tourism when I took a lecture tour to South India for the American Institute of Archaeology. Um, tours and travels, and I had never seen that this is what is happening now, that people actually dance performances, eating, how to wear a sari, um, all these are happening in people's houses, but people actually earn a living out of it. So the these heritage tourism now implicates a plethora of consequences other than the characterizations of a leisure activity, even for those who actually participate in it. And heritage tourists can be seen to be far more critical in sourcing nuanced cultural and social meanings from things than what we curators and specialists of heritage may deem worthy or may deem considerate. Consider so a conceptual construct, which it is, heritage, works as a seminal learning strategy. And I'll stop here. Thank you. Thank you so much. So Deshna, that was a very insightful session and some, some of our viewers have said. Uh, so Anita says that was an excellent lecture with the help of archival sources. Uh, we have a few questions, shall we take them up? Sure. Uh, Rajneesh also says great and very insightful. So uh, the first question is actually from Farooq. He asks, where does India stand vis-a-vis -vis, say the UK or uh, other European countries in terms of writing recent history? You mean contemporary history, Farooq? Yeah. Yeah. 
So we are big. So, okay. So this is a, as I would say, a dicey topic. In a way, archaeologists have started doing contemporary archaeology. Historians are looking at contemporary history. We in India, in India too, um, we talk in terms of, we teach in Shivnada University, there is a course on contemporary um, history, for example, let's say contemporary India is how the course is taught. And as one sees in terms of, if, even if we work with ancient Indian history, actually what we do do is write contemporary history, I mean, or write histories in the presence. So there are historians in India who are engaging with it in a very big way. There are archeologists who are engaging with it in a very big way, but we still seem to have some kind of a hackneyed ham hammered manner of, um, you know, dividing history into periods. And what we don't do is interrogate our scheme of periodization. So we still work in the presumption of ancient modern um, ancient medieval modern, instead of saying that these flow, we still sometimes draw out linear histories, but there are younger historians in India who have actually started looking at it. The problem here is, as and I don't want to name names, is sometimes these kind of histories actually start bordering on fiction. So how do you separate the fiction, because many of these contemporary histories, as you know, are written in terms of historical fiction as well, which has got a huge publishing market today. So that is a problem which we need to address. And it's a similar problem in the UK. So okay. if, even in the UK, there has been a huge fight as we speak. In fact, that's where I am um, in terms of Black Lives Matter, as you know. And the government has decided and has told every trustee in every museum and every public institution that they cannot indulge in it because it is too political. So trustees are basically leaving their jobs and they're saying we will not take this government injunction. And there, are, there is a huge push happening now to change school syllabus in terms of the kinds of history they teach because they only teach First World War, Second World War and the glory that was England. Very little say of the migrant community, very little say of the communities who have come in beginning. If we go to um, say Brick Lane or Hack, uh, especially Eastern London, the whole story of the migrants coming in, first the French Huguenots, followed by the Jews, followed by um, I think yeah, followed by the Jews, then the Bangladeshi, Pakistani, that community, and now more and more the East European communities, Polish and all who are coming in. So the topography of that area has changed. And then you can ask the question, whose heritage? What? Because even these people have lived there for so long. So that history, I think, has been mostly captured by people like Sadie Smith and Molly Kali, et cetera, fiction writers rather than historians. Very, very few historians have actually grappled with it. Thank you for that. That was insightful indeed. Uh, Neela also has a compliment. She says, thank you very much for the lecture. It's full of details that are not accessible to non-professionals. So I would yeah. agree with that too. Yeah, I mean, the, you know, I just feel very hesitant talking about it because it is there in my book. So, I mean, I didn't say something new. I also feel hesitant to talk to you all about Bombay because that's something I know very little about, though I did my studies in Pune. I'm from Deccan College, Pune. So, I mean, I do know the archaeology of Maharashtra inside out. And I do know the photographic archives of Bombay um, pretty well. So, there was a talk, there was something with Sarab, uh, Dr. Sarabji had said last time about the uh, Bombay Municipal's photographic archives going to the Bhauda Jilad. So that is because the Bhauda Jilad actually developed as a local museum, not the economic museum which it was supposed to be. So therefore, these Assyrian antiquities, they were left completely, uh, they got neglected. They, nobody knew what these antiquities were when they found them in 1891. And this was by a Parsi antiquity called Rustam Karkaria, who had no clue what they were. So first he said these were Layard's cargo, which Layard had said they were missing. And then they said, no, no, hang on a minute, it might be Rollinson. So there is a whodunit element, which I have, which is what I chased. And I actually stumbled across it when I was writing on histories of archeology span through collections and museums, because that I think is important because objects, act, objects and also monuments resist our interpretation. So it's not that easy to kind of say, this is Hindu, this is Muslim, this is Parsi, this is something, because the life histories show that many other people have used them as well in different ways. We have a viewer who has uh, an interesting take on historical fiction. You touched upon that. Okay. So they tell us that it's, of course, we all know that it's becoming very addictive these days. A lot of people are actually reading about things that they would not have otherwise read about because they have this thing that history is boring. 
Um, yeah. So do you think it's then a good thing that at least because of historical fiction, people are reading about history? Okay, um, well, good question. Because in my nasty high-handed manner, I would say, please don't conflate facts and fiction. On the other hand, historians, what is a fact? So we actually choose what we, what we choose to relate. And if we think about it, there was Amar Chitra Katha. I grew up reading about say, um, Mahabharata and Ramayana, not from, not from the books, not from the Sanskrit stuff, not from any text, but from these Amachitra Katha. So I think we also did that every, perhaps every generation has generated historical fiction. Think about 19th century, I can only, as a Bengali, I think about Anand Bankim Chandra, you know, Charles Chandra. So they all picked up, and in Maharashtra also, you've had um, histories of, uh, the Marathi histories, um, there, there were, there were, um, I could actually bring up, uh, and I know this only in English, it's called the Epitome of Histories of Assyria and Nineveh, et cetera, which, was, which also had a Marathi edition in 1840. So they have been there. If people get interested in history by reading fiction, there is no harm. Problem is when these fictions actually communalize, they do that as well. So they kind of tell you one story. If they can transparently lie down, just say, the author can say, look, I'm just telling you this story, but this might have this, this kind of a, um, event. While I'm telling you about this event, there might have been other things also happening around the event. If they can be transparent about it, that would be great. Before I move on to the next question, another compliment that I'd like to highlight is from Tapti Roy, who says, excellent lecture, a delight listening to you. Thank you. Uh, now I have two somewhat similar questions. So let's take both of them up and they deal with the biases that you mentioned that creep into these narratives. Uh, so the viewer says that um, the current, the prevailing attitudes or the prevailing uh, majority perspective or narrative often influences uh, how we are viewing historical fact. Uh, so how can countries protect against such biases and maintain a scientific anchor? Scientific anchor, if we come to the positivism of scientific anchor, then we are done for because there is no way one can actually um, deal with that. But if we just remember, and this is where I pick up objects. This is actually why I work with objects. This is actually why I work with collections because we realize that they really resist us from, uh, they resist interpretation. The Didar Ganj Yakshi, for example, we have no idea what it was used for. We have no idea when it was made. The, uh, and the whole idea that it got associated with the Mauryan chronology was an internal bias of its seeing. Now historians think it is of the Shunga Kushana period. Okay, so it is around 200 years later. It is today placed in the Bihar Museum, the new museum of Bihar as a conduit between the past and the present that the past antiquity actually shapes the splendors of modern Bihar, whatever. We do not know half the stuff. If we enter the Harappa gallery, we really don't know half the stuff, what they were used for. Um, and that is quite, quite. if we start thinking about what were these, what was that little red um, torso used for? What was the torso I showed you that, that black one used for? There are certain masks, what, what were they used? The tiny little beautifully made figures, including the so-called dancing girl, what were they used for? We don't know. So in terms of, we understand the communalism which is happening and it's not only happening in India, though it's happening there in a much, much stronger case as we know. But there's all, and if we look at histories, I think every every generation has gone through it when certain things got interpreted only in a certain manner. Look what the Britishers did to India. They classified these monuments as Hindu, Muslim, Christians, etc. They forgot, for example, that in Sarnath, the stupa was worshipped by the Hindus who left gold mohar, and there are uh, there is um, plenty of example. I mean. Uh, um, proof about this and writings about this in the 19th century. So the Hindus also came and worshiped these areas. So, so the, what we grapple with in terms of an intellectual world here is to interrogate our categories of classifying because we, class, we have to work with classifying the world or else we would, be, we would know how to anchor our thoughts. On the other hand, we really need to think in terms of the classification systems as we just adopt them without uh, very unreflectively, and objects allow us to do that because their life histories also tell you. For example, the Allahabad pillar, Ashokan pillar, you would, yeah, it was uh, Ashoka wrote the Brahmi script, and I say it like that. But then 
Samudra Gupta's inscriptions are there, Jahangir's inscriptions are there, 19th century inscriptions are there. So how do you des describe the Allahabad pillar? Is it an Ashokan pillar? Is it a Gupta pillar? So these are, every object is a palimpsest. You erase a part of it and you see some of the, some of the past reflecting at you. How you interpret that past is uh, probably um, conditioned by your own presence or you might find inscriptions which will tell you this is what it was. But the fact remains that each, the material world just tells us that histories are not simple. They are complicated, they are nuanced. And if we forget that, then we ought to forget uh, being historians. Everybody shouldn't be a historian. Let's just say it that way. So I'll stick with that line of thought of everybody not being a historian. So when lay persons consume such material outside of historical or uh, these older records that you showed us, how should a lay person, what are the say three or four things that a lay person should ask himself or herself to avoid being a victim to narrative bias? See, I can't, you know, it's a very difficult thing to say a lay person. A lay person comes with other kinds of knowledge. For example, an expert, I mean, and we, as, as heritage experts who would have seen that there's been a massive fight for the past 30 years, I think, between conservation architects and the archaeologists in the archaeological survey. I mean, this was one maha drama tamasha which was happening in the ASI for a long, long time. When And you see this with the Aga Khan Palace, the Aga Khan Trust version. They are one of the best conservation architects, for example, in India, and they have been very, very careful in terms of collecting the archives, archiving it, leaving certain things blank for a lay person's imagination to see how this may have been conserved if they hadn't touched it, etc. So you could, there's always a loop to ask. It's like asking a historian to go to a lab, which is run by a physicist. And I say it because my house is divided between history and physics. From the time we grew up as children, my father and my sister were physicists, my mother and I were history students, right? So it's a house divided with the only person who was had a literary bent of mind was my father who actually consumed. So this is a physicist consuming history. But he never said that I, this is my authority, that I am authorized to say that. So, you know, there is this history book thing, which is let the professionals do their jobs. Same thing with heritage conservation, let the architects do their jobs. But please, please, when you put up set text panels or you put up labels or you put up signage or you put up anything else for a lay person, can we please make your biases transparent on those signages? That might help. And it doesn't take very much to do so. You know, you can do things with, in a museum, for example, and that's, I always come back to that because of my work, is you put in donor, collector, doning date, collector date, source date, so that somebody can at least have an idea of how this thing came in, how this was collected, what this might represent. Mm -hmm. And um, many, very often, for example, the tribals, um, the so-called indigenous people, one, one should say, when they come into the museum, like they came to the Museum of Archaeology and Anthropology, they looked at us, there were some Sami people, they looked at us and they said, are you mad? You put the drum and you put the beating stick together, you will take away the, you have taken away a spirits of the God from it. Please remove one. The shaman from Nepal, a Nepali shaman came in and he just opened something and the light bulb went. And he said, look what you've done to our stuff. So these are also lay people. They come up with some, as I said, they come up with some innate knowledge of what their legacy would mean to them. Historians ought to listen to them, like curators ought to listen to them. So this is the ethical stuff about it. But if, say, a physicist, and it's been happening, or computer engineers write history books, and then they demand that those history books get into the curriculum, say, of university education, then we have a problem. Because if historians write physics books and then they demand that those books get into the curriculum of an undergraduate degree in, say, Bombay University or Delhi University, nobody would buy it. So that, that, is, that is the only distinction I would make. I mean, I, I'm somebody who, who moves between disciplines. Archaeologists don't think I'm an archaeologist. Historians don't think I'm an historian. Doesn't matter. But the point is, when it comes to, um, when it comes to pedagogy, I think when it comes to textbook writings, et cetera, that is where I think the role of the professional comes in. That's why we keep it. Thank you for that. We have one more question. That's the last question as of now. Um, Rajneesh wants to know how are we handling Rakhi Gadi? I'm curious since I come from that area. 
Right. I come from the alma mater, which is digging Rakhi Gari. I come from Deccan College. And as you know, Rakhi Gari has been excavated by um, uh, a former member of Deccan College. Rakhi Gari seems to be, on the face of Earth, one of the largest sites which we know of today of the Indus civilization, of which only one mound has been excavated fully. There are five large mounds, and it could be five times Mohenjo-daro, for all we know. Huge amounts of skeleton has come out from there. Enormous amount of skeletal material has come from there. And when I studied in Deccan College, which was in the 19, um, when was that? 1980s, late 1980s, um, Rakhi Gari was first excavated. And my professor, Dr. Dhavlikar, um, who said to me, he said, you know what? They found medieval skeletons and they're putting it up as medieval skeleton. Then that cemetery of Rakhi Gari was not known, but today it is known. Through that cemetery, there's a lot of work which is happening on DNA um, in terms of trying to look at ancestry of people. I am quite hesitant to think about that because common people who don't, I mean, and they are, they are not doing bad work. They're actually doing quite systematic work in terms of thinking through DNA. But common people have started associating this whole material with the ancient Aryan. And that is the problem. And there, you may you may put in all your equations and signs and everything up in the in the news media. But the way, if you cannot simplistically say what it all means and say that we are not talking in terms of drawing roots of ancestry very very clearly, this you cannot really draw these roots of ancestry because the samples are too small. And what ancestors? Race, as we know, is a spurious concept. So if you can't do that, then there is a problem with that. But let's just hope that the Rakhi Gari excavations come up with some amazing finds. And let's just hope that we do not have a nationalistic fight about we have got more of Indus than you have, which is what India has fought about for a very, very long time. So. And the last one I have is actually um, a small correction from Farooq, uh, not a question. So he says the image of the winged bulls in Bombay is not from the Bacha Giyari, it's a fountain known as Bhavati fountain and Bhavati Tower. Ron, I couldn't hear you. Can you say it again? Uh, he says the image of the winged bulls in Bombay is not from the Bacha Giyari, it's a fountain known as the Bamanji Hormanji fountain and clock tower. Thank you very much, Farooq. Um, because I, of course, pulled it out from the web. And as, as you saw, I credited it with the guy who had, the photographer who had done it. Thank you very much. I should, I mean, I haven't had the chance to kind of, this, I found the, uh, the plasticas in 2019. And that's actually when I went back to Bombay after, after a long time, 2015. And I would like to walk in Bombay and actually, and see if one can actually find some of the so-called, what they call the llamas. And I saw this exhibition, called the Eternal Flame, which, uh, which first happened in London, and then it came to the National Museum in Delhi, which was about the Parsi, the history of the Parsi community. And I think there is much more to see there. But thank you, Farooq, for that. And I also, um, he's also sent me a text about, I'm really sorry to know that Munchaji Kama has passed away this morning. I did not know because he invited me to give, I mean, when I went to the Kama Institute, it was, he was one of the, uh, he was the president or he was the head of that institute and thanks to him, um, and um, Dr. Nawaz Modi that I was allowed to take photographs of the plaster cast in the library. I literally stumbled across them. Thank you. And that's it for all the questions and the compliments. Uh, <laughs> thank you so much. That was very interesting. All of us have learned something, uh, whether we're historians or otherwise, all of us have learned something today over the past hour. Um, thank you. I hope thank you, you and everybody our pleasure. And I hope you and everybody who's on this session uh, today will also join us for future events, yes. uh, the workshop tomorrow or the virtual walk and also other talks. In the Thank you very much. Thank you.